Hey, thanks everybody. So super excited to be here. Uh, Techstars, uh, which we consider the world's number one tech accelerator, focusing on founders, focusing on teams, and then traction and market. We've launched in Canada. We're expanding uh, into more cities and countries around the world, and it's just been a super exciting ride, and so many corporate partnerships that are embracing the Techstars model, and so many of our alumni here from around the world, and a huge delegation of startups from Canada. I want to introduce a fantastic and fast panel on growth. We're going to do three panels back to back, all on growth, all with different founders that have figured out amazing ways to grow their companies. So I'm going to start with Lynn Dai, who is from Hooch. Give it up for Lynn. Hi, guys. So uh, I'm Lynn Dai. The company is Hooch. Uh, Hooch is the first ever subscription drink app where members receive one free drink every day. The, um, there's a short video uh, we're going to show you, so we're going to put Um, so we launched the app in New York in uh, November of 2015 and uh, went to South by Southwest the next year. Uh, we're now live in 10 different cities, nine in the US. The first international city is Hong Kong. So we basically is a marketing platform. Uh, we're a marketing platform that drives traffic to bars and uh, we collect a lot of analytical data about your drink preference and work with all the top alcohol companies in the world um, to better serve and, and target market to you guys. Uh, in 2018, we plan on expanding to 10 more cities. So 20 total cities, including um, Europe cities and, and more in Asia. And um, we're going to grow from about 500 venues to about 5,000 venues with a target with, uh, of about a million uh, members in 2018. Okay, thank you, Lynn. Next up, Evan Varsamis from The Gadget Flow. Thank you. Hey, everyone. My name is Evan Varsamis, and I'm the founder and CEO of Gadget Flow. Gadgetflow is a product discovery platform that reaches 25 million people per month. We're 28 people headquartered in New York, working with more than 6,000 customers, including Sony, Polaroid, Bang & Olsen, and more than 4,000 crowdfunding campaigns. You can use Gadgetflow to stay updated with the latest product releases and the hottest crowdfunding projects. You can sign up for an account to access our exclusive deals and discounts, uh, create a much more personalized experience, and of course, create your own private or public wish list. We've recently also launched um, an augmented reality feature for our iOS app using Apple's AR kit uh, and our virtual reality feature for a web version that basically lets you experience our products in virtual reality uh, using Google Cardboard or any other VR headset. 
Thank you. Thank you, Evan. Okay, introducing Teddy Chu from Dingo. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Teddy Chu. I'm the founder and CEO of Dingo. Uh, what Dingo do is uh, we help people to split payment in an easier way. So uh, just like imagine when you're hanging out with your friends and then go on road trip, what will you do? You will have to take selfie with your friends, right? Using social media stuff. And then second, you will have to split the payment with them. So we are trying to find a way that uh, since we are doing the same thing together, we want to combine these two you know, into one solution. So, Dingo is a mobile payment app that helps you to split the payment with your friends by a very easy steps. The first step, you have to take a picture of the food or the selfie or anything like that for memorized use. And then second, you just input how much you spent with your friends. We will help you to calculate tips and tags and the total amount. And the final step is just select people who is involved in the payment, and then all set. You will send a notification to your friends, and then they will say, oh, OK, I got it. Teddy want to charge $12 from me. I just click OK, and then the payment is down. So you don't have to use calculator. You don't have to talk to your friends. Yeah, that's our product. And currently, we have 100K users right now. And then we are going to hit 3 million transactions at the end of the year. Uh, we are a US-based company, and then we want to expand to Europe this year. Thank you. OK, thank you, Teddy. And finally, Thierry Subestra from Synthesio. Hi, everybody. So I'm the former CEO of Social Karma, which have been acquired in July by Synthesio. And at uh, Social Karma, we have created Profiler, which is an audience insight and market research platform, which is using Facebook data. So what we go, the goal of the, the solution is really to help marketers make smarter decisions by leveraging the power of social media and what Facebook knows about each and any of us. Um, about the, the growth thing and what we have uh, faced, I think the most important message I would like to give you is uh, the, what we call the product market fit. And we have created a solution like three years ago. At the beginning, it was just a bunch of Excel files that we were giving to the marketers. And we've been struggling at the beginning to simply make the app useful and making sure that the people and the marketers were understanding the information we were providing. And so we've been working on that. And it has been a, a long journey in order to be able to generate these uh, personas which make the information useful and viable for all of them. And last but not least, if you need to uh, sell your solution, the product in itself is just half of it. You will have to work on uh, commercializing, marketing the solution, making it useful, making it understandable. And that's why you have all these things which will lead you, hopefully, at the end, to uh, being Leonardo and drinking stuff in your boat. Thank you. Thank you, Thierry. OK, we have 11 minutes. I want to fire through the panel and just give you all an opportunity to really just lead the discussion. So let's just start with the question of what really led to the growth phase of your company? Was there something you did or someone you hired that started to make things happen? Starting with you, Lin. Yeah, so um, in the beginning, our biggest challenge was um, people thought the deal was too good to be true. Like, what do you mean for $10, I can get 30 free drinks? So we had a lot of resistance from people actually paying for a subscription. So what we did was um, at South by Southwest, we decided to unleash your first drink for free no matter what. So you can go try your first drink at any of our bars, show the app, and get your first drink. So people are like, oh, this actually works. And the second thing we did is uh, we started allowing our members to refer other members. And you can earn a free month yourself if you get somebody to sign up. So yeah, that really kicked, through, kicked out the virality effect. Because not only do you want a free drink, you really want to get a free drink with a bunch of your friends. So. I guess for us, it's more like building a product around our users and our customers and not the other way around. Um, also, hiring the right people at the right time played a significant role. It's always challenging as a self-sustained company um, you know, to hire more people to help you grow. 
uh, but you definitely need it up to a certain point and after. Um, so um, we think it should be the people we hire. Because at the first, we, well, uh, we thought, OK, we are a fintech company, and then we want to hire someone from the bank. They know how the system works. And then we figure out that, OK, they are the old structure people. So we cooperate with a fraternity in the US, uh, in the UC Berkeley. So they help us to you know, expand to the whole country. Yeah, well, for us, I think the, the key has been really putting the customer at the center of a of our product. At the beginning, it was more a tech thing, and we were trying to uh, help and make the customers understand what we were doing. And then we realized that the customers was the one important here. Uh, we just changed the way we were developing the software and just uh, say, okay, now we are going to help you use the software and understand what we are doing. And that changed totally the, the feeling they got about what we're doing. Okay, so just with you, Thierry, when Social Karma was acquired, you ran Social Karma, and yeah. Synthesio bought you. Was it, did they buy you because of growth metrics that you had already been experiencing at Social Karma, and you came into Synthesio, Synthesio to be like the growth engine of that company? Yeah, well, they acquired us because they had the solution. We have already a uh, few customers uh, in Europe mainly. And for them, yeah, they saw us as an opportunity to help us going uh, live and global. So it was... Uh, they are also at the heart of the, of the growth strategy now because they are offering us a visibility which we didn't have when we were just in Brussels. So, Teddy, I see that you guys are on university campuses all over America, starting in the, your launch cities. It's obviously students are your core, or one of your core customers. What are you doing on campuses? How are you getting the word out? Where are you spending money? How are you enlisting people to get you know, young kids on the app? So, basically, we just try to hang out with them a lot like almost every day, especially weekends. So as I mentioned, uh, we used to like, you know, hire the bank people to do the marketing, but that's like far away from our customers. So we hired a, a student or a graduate student from the fraternities, and then he's a real fraternity people. So he helped us to you know, connect to the core people in the fraternities or sororities, and then we just party with them a lot, and then you know, they would say, ah, good, we'll just use your product, because our product just fit their lifestyle. Yeah, so that's the... So Evan, I, I think Gadget Flow is a very elegant design. It, it looks great. I like how you curate products. When I go there, I find an emotional response. I want to buy things. Was that, um, how did you get to that point? And I think, and how do you attribute um, appropriate and elegant and simple design with your growth numbers that you've been experiencing at Gadget Flow? So, I mean, it all started by finding a gap in the market, right? So initially, when we launched Gadget Flow, obviously it's not what it is today. So there was a lot of A-B testing, a lot of experimenting in between. Um, but like I said before, it's all about building a product around your users. So when you're like a small startup, it's too easy to just go ahead and ask whether, that, whether you're like a founder, whether you're like the CEO of the company, um, to ask around and say, hey, what do you want to see next for our company? Uh, what would you like us to change for you? So I think that's one of the best tips that I can give to every startup out there um, that they're launching their product today. Okay. Uh, Lynn, uh, you've raised, I believe, $8 million. Um, tell us how much and, and what, what money, what proportion of that raise are you spending specifically on growth? And in what, in what modality, in what way are you spending that, that money? Yeah, so uh, we're spending over 50% of uh, anything we raise on growth. So um, digital acquisition is a, is a huge funnel. Um, so, you know, luckily we are able to employ some um, growth tactics that um, organic and user-to-user -user referrals is our number one um, channel for user growth. But, um, you know, we, we, we do targeted spend on Facebook and Instagram, and we also do a lot of offline spending. So we build a bartender army. When you walk into one of our bars, our bartender will try to get you to sign up with their code, and we will deposit $10 into the bartender's account immediately. I want everyone just to think about whether there was a, a moment in the company, like a tipping point, where you, you, you tried something and it led to you know, continued success and you just kind of started to double down on, on a spend or on a, a strategy with growth, whether it's people that you were bringing in or a culture that you were trying to implement in the company. So it's a kind of an abstract question, but maybe, you know, maybe someone at the end will start with, with it. Maybe at, at, social, at karma, social Karma, you had some experiences where things just started to work. Yeah, um, 
again, it would be uh, around the, the way you are commercializing the product and the digital marketing we were doing. So we were experts of Facebook uh, targeting because we were working with that all day long. And it has been really successful when we started to reach the right people with the right message. And it was really hard to uh, just make the, the, the user at the center of the experience and making sure that he was understanding what he was using when he was accessing the website, when he was uh, uh, doing a free registration, and so on. And then it started to grow. And when we saw the numbers, uh, the tipping point, like you said, and we started growing very quickly at that, at that point. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're a big company. You've raised, I think, $30 million. And so it's, a, it's essentially an, an enterprise SaaS company that's helping your clients grow as well. But how do, you, how do you keep that momentum going when you get to that level of, I think, 180 or more employees, um, maybe many more employees now? Yeah, well, you have to reinvent uh, yourself every day also because we know that a lot of competitors are coming under the market. So it's about reinventing what we're doing, how we are doing it, and improving the experience uh, toward the users. And then, of course, when you are getting to that stage, you have to professionalize the company for every aspect. So sales are becoming uh, a machine which is really working uh, differently with the digital marketing on top of that. And it's really about improving every aspect of the company. And Teddy, you switched, sorry, you switched out of Venmo and got into your own banking payment app. Was that a trigger point for growth in, uh, with, with, with you? With yeah, definitely. Because uh, the, the, the experience we use at like, other providers' API is not very stable. And then since we connect to the bank directly, it's like super smooth. And then we can control the whole process, the experiment. So that helped us a lot. Um, so we got lucky with a hire. So, um, Quick story. So I was friends with one of my friends was the head of marketing for Red Bull in Hong Kong. So we ran to each other at the wedding. I showed him what I was doing. He was so blown away. He went back. He calls me and he's like, "I'm gonna go into my boss's office and quit my job because you're making me GM for Hong Kong." And I was like, "We we don't have any budget to go Asia expansion yet." He's like, "Don't worry. We'll get everything set up. Hong Kong, you don't have to pay me until Hong Kong start making a revenue." And what we by accident discovered was culturally. So in America, when you get a deal, you're kind of shy about it. If I got my you know, new sneakers for 50% off, I, I don't really tell my friends about it. But in China, in Hong Kong, if my mom saves $5 on her groceries, she's talking about it for five, five days, right? So, uh, so we really have this viral uh, virality effect that's really about people bragging culturally uh, about the deal they got. So who kind of went viral, and Hong Kong is one of our biggest cities. Uh, so we're going to do the same thing in other Asia cities because of that experience. Uh, the fact that you're operating in two distinct cultures, in Hong Kong and in the US, does that, I can see some advantages, but that, does that cause you any problems in the way that you're growing your company where you have cultural uh, tendencies in one economy in one country and not necessarily in the other? Yeah, you know, even just on the tech side, even though, you know, both uh, regions speaks English, just to get the you know, the currency conversion, right, tech tie, we, we totally underestimated um, how long it is. And in Hong Kong, we price basically the, the membership is ADA, ADA, because the word, you know, the number eight is lucky in, in Chinese culture. And, and you know, we, but we can't do a 50% off because 4444 is a really bad, bad luck number, right? So, um, so we had to pay attention to, to these nuances. So Evan, you, your team was a, a dynamic young team from Athens, Greece, where this all began. Uh, you've come a long way. What kind of advice would you give uh, early stage entrepreneurs in their journey of launching their tech company, particularly a consumer facing e-commerce company, to kind of go the distance or get through the tough parts of the early stages when you guys were just a bunch of bloggers in an right. apartment in Athens? I mean, get ready to get punched in the face basically every single day. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Um, you got to work more than 12 to 13 hours every single day, including weekends. You're going gonna to have to sacrifice a lot of things, especially if you're like er, young, like forget your early 20s. Uh, it's as simple as that. It's a, it's a constant fight, uh, being an entrepreneur on a daily basis. Um, but, it's, but it's also fun and it pays off on the long run. Okay, exactly on time. A big round of applause for this team of great people. And please follow them on social media. Get to know them, great products, and we'll, we'll start with our very next panel.